Previously on Handbook for Mortals. Girl, you marched in here one day acting like you owned the place, and yet the crown was set upon your dainty Lisa Frank colored head anyway, all without you having earned it. Can you see why I'm annoyed? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. But counterpoint. If I bat my eyelashes and have you sing for my finale, will you join Zeb, Mac, and Jackson over there and bend the knee? Another cluster of weeks pass, and we've all now settled into a normal routine of absolutely no progression. We're at another session of rehearsals! Yay! Sherry's up along the grid with Mac, waiting for her cue. She's donning her safety harness like a good performer, but you know what? It just doesn't, just doesn't feel right. And instead of requesting help from the stagehand, like Mac, who is standing really close to her for some reason, she takes to fumbling with it herself, thereby becoming a liability to the production. Smart. And, wait, hold on a second. Where's Riley? Isn't he supposed to be here assigned tech boy? Is he having an emergency smoke break out back? Look, I know nicotine withdrawals can hit like a bitch, but damn kid, there's a time and a place. Sherry contorts her body in some obscure yoga pose and Max overcome with the urge to commit some sexual harassment as a little treat. But it's okay since they're dating, but not really, question mark. She feasts on his compliments as that's her only true source of nourishment. He seizes an opportunity to grab part of Sherry's harness and pulls her real close. Mac continues being horny on Maine, saying she looks amazing in anything, and even better in nothing, while he rubs the small of her back. What a pinnacle of professionalism. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Technical Director. Sir? HR just paged me, and I believe they would like a word with ya. Okay, okay, okay. Look, I'd like to say... It's not the little on-the-clock playfulness I'm poking at here. It's that this is a character who has displayed a stringent work ethic. Unless Sherry's attraction aura really isn't a throwaway element, he wouldn't be feeling her up like this? Nor would he allow her to possibly fuck up her harness. If anything, he'd be running triple or quadruple checks on the thing. He wouldn't be distracted by her big googly blue eyes. He'd just be like, girl, stop moving so I can fix this buckle. Oh my God. That aside, did I happen to stroke out some point and miss them hooking up? Cause the way he comes onto her so strongly has got to imply something, right? Please tell me I'm not alone here. If this were anybody else aside from Jackson, they'd get smacked for sure. Like, come on. Anyway, Mac finally remembers where he's at and adjusts a buckle on Sherry's harness. He helps her up to her mark for the cue and sneaks in a quick little smooch at the last second. Sherry melts. But she glances over and notices Charles just, like, hanging out along the grid, too. Weird. She pretends not to notice him and prays he didn't witness that kiss. Sherry also remarks to us, in the clunkiest, most repetitious way possible, how unusual it is to see Charles take part in the rehearsals. Now, this is almost overspeak of the week levels of prose, but I don't think we'll ever top Chapter 6's behemoth. She wonders what Charles is doing there, because unless they were adding any new elements to the acts, he'd prefer to watch the rehearsals from the audience. When he did that, he would use a stand-in, which is something else Zeb would do. Zeb really is the company's mother hen, huh? Zeb could technically do the show if he needed to, but Charles never has missed a show, and the masses don't come to see Zeb. Okay, I know I have at least one watcher here who would totally go see Zeb headline a show. Hell, I'd wager a fair amount of my viewership would watch Zeb star in a show, alongside Sophia, of course. So, mainly Zeb's job was to simply stand in for Charles at the rehearsal. Zeb, as a magi, also had his own spots, though, and Renee, another magi, filled in for Zeb's parts during the rehearsals. It works out, because Renee can do both his and Zeb's part without too much hassle. Ugh. I'd ask who the hell Renee is, but apparently they're just some other magi, and I think I should just nod and smile at that. I'd be inclined to bet that that's the last we'll ever see their name anyway. I assume they're Zeb's second-in-command. Who knows, who cares? Sherry did say she memorized everyone's names, and boy howdy, she likes to let us know that. Once she's situated up on her mark and cue, 
Mac takes his chance to go check on his team at the automation board. We then transition to good old italics vision. Oh man, it's been such a hot minute since we had one of those. <laughs> We're still at the same moment in time. As Mac turns around to check on said automation board, boom, Charles is hovering right there in front of him, behind him. We're reminded that Charles can have an intimidating aura, which, considering how we saw him way back in Chapter 2, it checks out enough. And really, just having this daddy randomly decide to loiter around the grid, of all places, for no apparent reason, is enough to give me the heebie-jeebies. A little. I mean, the, da the daddiness gives him a little bit of a pass in my book. But that's just me. I digress, though. We're then reassured that because Mac is just so ding ding doodly competent at his job, he's far too valuable to be fired for practically anything. You know, the genius who fixes mics by finagling them around till it's magically better again. The guy who puts his favoritism on full display has bouts of petulant behavior, all under the guise of a true professional. Completely invulnerable to repercussions. He's been there for so long, he might as well have some sort of tenureship equivalency. Charles requests Mac a moment of his time in his office. Mac says, sure, you're the boss, which is a bit of a weird response in my opinion. It gives me the impression that Mac feels guilty over something and is sucking up to save his skin. That, mixed with the previous reassurance of his totally stupendous, infallible work ethic, doesn't aid his case. To which, again, can we just like flip back a few pages where your boy commits a little sexual harassment for funsies? I'm just saying, I do not appreciate all these mixed signals here. We're told that in normal meetings between the two of them, Charles would immediately sit at his desk, put on his sexy reading glasses, and whip out his show notes to go over. He'd typically begin to read his notes and ask questions without even looking up at Mac to make sure he was ready. Because a proper daddy knows when it's time to work and when it's time to play. Ah, it seems our young Padawan still has much to learn when it comes to horny time management. However, Charles doesn't make a beeline for his desk as usual, which promptly tips Mac off. He ponders if Charles is going to have him fire someone else instead. You see, it wouldn't be the first time that's happened, as there was an instance of Charles imploring Mac to let go of a lighting guy whom Charles didn't click with, to which Mac complied, because he didn't happen to have any attachment to said lighting guy anyway. Now, I don't doubt that's how things go in real life, but I think this is a good peek at how callous both of these guys can be. Mac hopes his time, Charles won't push him to fire a crew member he actually favors, like Riley, who happened to call out sick today. Ugh, like, I guess thanks for that clarification, Serum. Would have been nice to have had it a few pages ago when I was wondering why Mac was where Riley should be. But you know, hey, look, there's that favoritism of his again. It's right there. Charles finally takes his seat and straight up assumes the Gendo pose. He's all serious business and asks Mac if he may be frank here. Mac, who loved being the smartest and typically would try to make light of things if he could, jovially responded with a laugh. Sure, you're the boss. You can be Bob or Bill too if you want. What? Who are you? Is the narrator on crack? Have they read this book? I mean, obviously not, considering how Mac was ready to jump Sherry's bones at the beginning of the chapter. But in what universe is Mac the jovial smartass type? Sure, he's had hopey-ass dialogue since we've met him, but Mac Kent, man with a stick shoved far up his ass, leaves be sprouting out of his throat, is anything but... I mean, to pull that kind of shit with his boss is so comically out of character, especially since Mac knows Charles isn't the type to play along with a bit. He's mansplained this to Sophia back in Chapter 5! Now, I know I said Mac is putty to be molded into whatever kind of guy Sharon needs to be at any given moment, but she chooses now to sculpt Mac into Tad? Are you kidding me? We already have one of those, and that's still one tat too many! Credit words do, though. I get a genuine kick out of Charles' deadpan response. He is so unamused and not here for Max's little bits that my soul resonates with him. You gotta love a daddy. Anyway, to the surprise of absolutely no one, there'd be no surprise Pikachu face in this house. 
The subject of the meeting is Sherry. This whole scene is very much akin to a father grilling his daughter's boyfriend on what his intentions are. A daddy's gotta make sure his baby girl's not gonna be led astray. Ah. Wink. Max stands his ground, responds that lots of people in their company date, him and Sophia included. So why does he care? Charles is evasive and says, Well, you both are very important to me. Professionally. I know my show would struggle without you. And she, well, you see how special and important she has become to us. She brings something extremely unique. Wouldn't want anything to cause issues. Okay. One, I haven't seen shit that demonstrates how she's special and important to them in regards to how she affects the company. You won't show me any of the shows. Unless that one rehearsal was supposed to be sufficient and carry through the rest of the book. Which it's not. So, what else could he be alluding to? Hmm. Two, she brings something extremely unique. Like her magic, right? That's, that's the illusion. Did... Sherry really break the Magi code or whatever from that secret meeting in Chapter 2? Mm. Max, like, we're friends. We haven't labeled it beyond that, though. Uh, yeah, okay. File that one under line said before a catastrophe. Right next to what could possibly go wrong. We rehashed some greatest hits, such as Do You Love Sherry? and uh, I don't know. We've known this song and dance since Chapter 3 well enough by now. Except this time, Max Brain Gerbil yeets itself straight into the stratosphere as it actually dawns on him that we're two pretty open and honest people who were especially open and honest with each other. They sure had a decent amount of things they just didn't talk about. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's file that one in the catastrophe folder as well. Dang, the Sarah's practically setting off the upcoming disaster claxes herself here. Though, we knew this shit some chapters ago. But I'll admit, maybe my bar has lowered itself so low that I am reassured in knowing that this is a plotline that'll actually come to a head. Because, like I said, this is a bubble that's been due to pop at some point. Charles asks Mac again if he loves Sherry. This time, Mac seriously contemplates that for a few paragraphs, and he concludes that he may very well love her after all. Charles is like, Well, so long as you both remain professional at work, I don't care. Thanks for being honest and direct. The conversation ends there, but before Mac leaves, he internally dunks on Charles over how f***ing weird he is. We also learn that Charles toured as a magician with some circus back in his 20s, so that can only mean he totally lacks finesse when dealing with others. LOL, boss wants to tea on my budding love life with a co-worker and hopes it won't adversely affect our shared workplace. All those years with those dirty carnies must have really hindered his social skills. Like what a weirdo. Not an eccentric though. I don't believe in such classist bullshit. Like, what a rude ass. <laughs> wow. Mac leaves the office, but stands off to the side so his lagging operating system can finish processing what just happened. Man. It's like he was just molded for Sherry, because how many times has that happened to her? Scene ends, and we transition out of Italic's vision. <laughs> One double space day later, Max still feeling shook from his meeting with Charles, and Sherry's picking up on his anxious vibe. The two of them are strolling through the park. Again, when some bicyclist rando clips past Sherry, this causes her to drop her purse and spill all its contents. The bicyclist doesn't even bother to shout back a quick apology. The nerve! But Sherry is livid. Such rudeness should not be tolerated within her domain. Her she-hulking fury consumes her once more. Before she even comprehends it, she squeezes her fist and sends the bicyclist careening over an imaginary pothole. He landed pretty hard on his back and made a few loud sounds of shrieking pain as the bike crashed into a bench, sending a few pieces going in different places. I was fairly certain he wasn't permanently injured, but he also wasn't going to be riding anymore today, that's for sure. <gasps> Good God! Can you imagine that biker was a woman? Pretty sure she would have straight up died. Sherry is so sadistic, oh my God! Again, she truly missed out on her calling as a villainess. Not only that, 
But why have we seen Sherry demonstrate her abilities for violent means more often than performative? Are we sure she's even an entertainer at all and not some poorly crafted, unreliable narrator bamboozlement? I mean, it wouldn't be the only one I'd be reading right now. But okay, Sherry absolutely TKOs this by Garanda. Surely the surrounding park dwellers notice this, right? Those shrieks of pain totally alert nearby park dwellers to help, yeah? Surely Max gotta be curious enough to peek back. Yeah? Right? Totally? Max back was to the biker, so he didn't even see what happened, and was too preoccupied with examining the tarot cards to even notice what I'd done. I hoped what I'd done to the biker might teach him a karma-related lesson. Oh my f <laughs> Oh man! I can just imagine some poor bystander off in the distance all like, Oh my f God! That poor guy just got totaled by a pebble! Someone should call an ambulance! Meanwhile, everyone else is carrying on with their merry day, and as Mac remains ignorant to the scene, the carnage behind him, it gets progressively more horrific. Ah! His back just arched so far I think I heard a snap! And, and blood's now souping from his face! Is anyone gonna do something? Silence. Oh! Alright! Uh, now his head has just popped clean off, and there are spiders marching in a conga line out of his skull while chanting Oru Fortuna. Why is no one else seeing this? <laughs> Instead, though, Mac is hypnotically drawn to the pretty pictures in front of him, like a five-year-old. We just witness Sherry use her power, violently, again, because this is no longer just a single case incident. <laughs> and not a single soul cares. There are no repercussions. We're just gonna move right along, folks. Nothing to see here. There is no war in Ba Sing Se. <laughs> okay. So, Mac, Mr. Vegas veteran doesn't know what the darn heckity tarot cards are, and when Sherry fills him in, he turns his nose up at it. Also, it's shown to us, shocking I know, that the devil card is most prominently displayed in his hand. Going off of basic bitch Google info, my much more knowledgeable commenters from the Chapter 8 Part 2 video, shout out to y'all, and my own abilities to bullshit and ass pull, I'd interpret this as Mac choosing the temporary pleasure of the sweet pussy that he isn't actually getting as far as I know, over the long-term mental toll that is being strung along for many months. And with the way he snubs Sherry's beliefs, Mac is also being held back by the bondage of his own logic, perhaps? So I guess he's the stereotypical stubborn atheist? Maybe? But this becomes a point of contention between them. Sharam stands her ground, says she's from a family of... The slur I don't need to show again. Confused old Max like, I thought you were Jewish. And if you were like me and spouted, wait, she's Jewish? Out loud? Um, let me set your mind at ease. Sky Turner confirmed this back in the foreword for all of us with a goldfish memory over here. She reassures Mac, with only a touch of patronization, that her background and beliefs aren't mutually exclusive. Mac digs his feet in the sand, claiming she's too smart okay, for this hogwash, and he makes the assumption that she shouldn't believe things just because her family does. Sherry taps into her innate sense of manipulation and appeals to his sense of curiosity, but he's not having it, finding all that voodoo stuff to be bullshit. And oh, to be fair to Sherry, Mac does come off like an insensitive dick with how he stamps over her beliefs, as well as not understanding in general how the basic concept of faith works. Their little kerfuffle blows over when they decide to agree to disagree. Sherry's used to hearing such things from others, so she's not insulted. Even though I actually wouldn't blame her if she was, especially since she's sorta of kinda of dating him. Instead, she's just disappointed, yet relieved Mac doesn't think she is the literal devil, like, the card he picked up. Ugh. They hug and kiss it out. Sherry's hopeful that he'll eventually come around, because that always works out perfectly. 
The scene ends with them continuing along their leisurely stroll. Another double space later. Sherry and Jackson are out to see a movie. Apparently she had movie choice the last time they went out, so now it's his turn. He chooses a Ryan Reynolds flick. Sherry takes a few sentences to stand Mr. Reynolds and Kettle Corn, her all-time favorite movie snack. I am so glad I learned that instead of literally any other thing I prefer to see. Thank you so very much. After the movie, Sherry and Jackson are strolling arm in arm up the street. He thanks her for not trying to drag him to some chick flick. And I'm like, girl, come on. You think Sherry would willingly choose something to see that is about or starring or just anything about women, please? She's like, no problem. It was fun. I enjoy the company. And here I was beginning to think my love spell wasn't working, he responds. And it woos Sherry somehow. Okay, I'll admit there's an actual attempt at establishing chemistry here. It's only hindered by the writing, so the rapport comes off as awkward. Also, if Jackson is secretly in the know with a magical society, this could pass for double meaning. But I think he's just a dork like Mac. Serum has a type, and I can't disparage her for that. Lord knows I'm not one to talk. They decide to check out a nearby instrument shop for a new acoustic guitar since Sherry wants to stop stealing Jackson's. Along the way, they pass by a Palmentero reading place, which catches Jackson's attention. He stops and is like, hey, you want to do something crazy and get a reading? Dude, you live in Vegas. What kind of boring ass life are you leading if that's crazy for you? Nevertheless, Sherry's pleasantly surprised. You don't think it's stupid? And he's like, nah. Sherry fills him in on her tarot-filled upbringing now as well, and how she's used to being judged for it. Like from her main love interest, for instance, just, just some paragraphs ago. Jackson assures her that he's not like all them other folks, and she swooned at his acceptance for tarot. They kiss so passionately that her knee popped which anyone who's ever seen any romantic movie would know is a very good thing. End of chapter. So that was a thing. Though I really liked seeing Charles again. He's the only guy I find interesting now. Move over Jackson's potential. Charles is my best friend now. I just wish we had more screen time for him. If you couldn't guess by now, I'm positively weak for a daddy, especially an eccentric one. Other than that, hey, Serum, just so you know, our single collective brain cell didn't fizzle out with the virus. We all see what you did there. That dead little space rover on Mars could have seen what you've done. Hell, I don't think Serum could be more overt if she tried. That's a lie. I'm sure she'd find a way. But yeah, girl, I get you want to juxtapose both Love and Tris's opinion on the biggest factor of their precious idol's life, but you, you had to do it back to back like that? Really? Like, come on, that's just lazy. You gotta at least have an iota of subtlety if you're gonna contrast their inherent differences. Or, hell, put something else in between the two scenes to at least break it up. Ah, uh, now if you'll excuse me, I believe I hear a horde of demonic brain spiders on their way to claim me as their next host vessel. Eh, 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 oh, oh god, oh god, someone get me some holy ray! Ah! But the power that is coordinated! Uh, get back, you little shit! Ah! Uh, 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 oh. <coughs> <coughs> uh, okay, I, I think I managed to lose those unholy spiders by jumping from 2D to 3D. <laughs> Dumb little things. Well, since I still have you here. I might as well talk about my sponsor for today's video. That's right, baby. I got a sponsor. I've got Galmon Pen Display 1561 tablet that, for starters, has a very nice felt slipcover. Ooh, softer material than my knife. Here's the display itself. It has a 15.6 inch work area screen that is, oh, so very smooth. So smooth, I can slide right across it. Mm -mm, very nice indeed. It's also thin and lightweight, and it makes it easy to travel with. It 
also has 10 customizable buttons with its power menu buttons along the side right here and its connection ports along the other side. Other accessories include a lightweight battery-free pen and pen holder with replaceable nibs inside. A drawing glove. These reduce friction on the screen so your hand just glides across the surface. Truly a godsend. Gaumon didn't need to go the extra mile to include that, but they did. What's Chad's? There's also those screws and screwdriver for the stand, which you can attach onto the back of the tablet. There's a pulley lever at the bottom so you can easily adjust the angle. Now to try the tablet itself. Don't mind the human hand, it's just for show. The display shows a 1920 by 1080, 16 by 9 aspect ratio. It displays 72% sRGB colors and an 8192 pen pressure. The display also doesn't blare light in my face, which my eyes are thankful for, especially since I like to draw at night. In the dark. Okay, okay. Don't be fooled by my sad self-portrait, please. I assure you I am a professional artist doing my best in my most hunched over shrimp posture. I'd otherwise use this display while in a more cozy curled up position, but right now I'm just doing my best. Oof. Let me try and really show that there's actual pen pressure here. Mmm. Gorgeous. Lol. And that's Galmon's pen display number 1561. The product link will be in the description and thank you to Galmon for the tablet. Okay. Okay, now, now we can roll credits. Why, hello there. So nice of you to drop by. If you'll please become utterly entranced by this crudely drawn hip swiveling, I'd like to deliver my ending spiel. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you all for watching. If you like what you see, and how can you not look at these hips go? Please consider supporting me on my Patreon, where you can get one day early access to all upcoming videos, as well as the entire uncut audio of book reviews. You can hear me yap for almost double the amount of time! You can also vote for the next novel for me to suffer through, or enjoy. I'm at y'all's mercy after all. I can even draw sketches for you at child labor prices! Oh! I jest, I jest. Kinda. If you're unable to support me on a subscription basis via Patreon, and I totally understand, I also have a Kofi page tip jar for your instant generosity needs. You do you, boo. No judgment. Finally, a like and subscribe still goes a long way. I'm eternally grateful for any and all support. You may now peel your eyes away from this sexy, sexy penguin body. Remember to stay hydrated, friends, and take care.